Okay, so now that the sun is up and one or two of the hyenas might be getting up as well, I'm going to keep going around in this area, seeing if we can't find that lion that was roaring. I'm going to send you over to Trishala, who's also heading to the hyena den. with the hyenas, lots of tracks all over the place, but also lots of elephant tracks all over the place. So no luck with the hyenas, that's okay. I'm gonna keep on moving. We're now at Treehouse Dam, but we're gonna take, we're gonna go a little bit further south. I think we actually wanna take, or at least I want to take Twin Dams instead of Treehouse Dam Road. There's not much happening at the dam. We can have a quick look. Very, very quiet. The reflection in the water is like a mirror. So let's keep on moving. I saw a young elephant bull in this block as well except he was a little bit nervous, so he was going further and further into the block as we are looking at him. So I'm hoping that there's another herd around that he's on the periphery on, off, or maybe he's being pushed out of, or maybe he's trying to follow. Whatever it is, we'll figure it out. sure how I feel about what I want to see today. I'll go and leave tomorrow just for a little bit and then I'll see you guys again in the middle of the month, middle of June. And I always feel like I have big plans when it's the last day of my of my stint. But this time I don't have any big plans. Yes elephants, elephants will be here one that I always would love to spend time with. A leopard would be lovely too. But I feel very uh, content this time around. So let's just see what the bush wants to give both Steve and I for our last days of our stints. Although I'll be back soon. Feels like last day just kind of crept up on me, which is nice. It means that we're being productive, and uh, time is going past quite quickly. Let's have a look at these. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the hyenas, <coughs> excuse me, the hyenas hang out in this drainage that's just a little to the south of this road, elephant carcass. And we're still trying to figure out where that impala had been dragged to. Um, and I suspect, it may, I suspect that perhaps it could be here where the little cubs hang around. Anyway, let me send you over to Pridelands. They're out and about on Bushwalk and I want to say good morning. Good morning and welcome to Wild Earth. We are live at the Eco Training Pridelands and are already started our bush walk. So my name is JP LaRue and behind the camera we've got Glenn. Our plan for this morning is to start our walk from here and just go and see what we can go and find. At the moment we're just staring out over this distant open area and we're also listening to hear if there's anything that we can detect. When you work in the bush, it's almost like learning a new language. Once you understand the alphabet and you become confident with the language, you start being able to interpret it in a very different way. Everything tells us a little bit of a story, the tracks, the sounds that different animals and birds will tell you, 
and even just to be familiar with the different repertoire of calls that a certain species can provide can tell you a lot about what is going in and on around you at that moment. We had a distant murmur of some alarm calls that was created by Crested Franklin, which is very different to their normal call when they're just trying to contact one another. These often will tell us that there's a potential predator or threat around them that is hindering them. These threats might be anything from a leopard, a snake, or a mongoose that might disturb them, but it's always worthwhile following up. Tracks also tells us a great story about what is going on. Quite often those little tracks will tell us if an animal has passed here, it will tell us if it's fresh, old, and if it's worthwhile following up or not. We're just going to sit here for a little bit longer, then start our walk and go and see what we can go and find. Helping kids to fall in love with nature is critical. Our future depends on it. Wild Earth has had the opportunity to take many children from all over the world on safari. Some from right here on our doorstep. Welcome to those of you watching from Hananani Primary School, just outside Dixie Village. They love um, like learning about nature because you know now we, we're having like a crisis um, of like rhino coaching. We all need each other, so it is very very important for the kids to learn about animals, on how to save them or even to protect them. My favorite animal is an elephant because they are very cute, although they're eating the trees or the plants, but they are still very cute to me. The way they explained. Um, the animals asking questions and we saw, saw our names on the screen. It was so exciting. Across southern and east Africa, the Endangered Wildlife Trust works tirelessly to save species, protect critical habitats and benefit people. Join the EWT in returning wildlife to the wild. Go to ewt.org.za to find out more and follow our socials to see how you can get involved. Protecting forever, together. My name is Ross and I'm a field guide at and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve. I love getting questions from guests on Wild Earth because I love sharing and learning information about nature with new people and it also makes me feel like you're all joining me in real life. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, go to our live safari page and submit your question below our live feed. We have a baby pangolin, a baby pangolin. This is off the charts. I'm, uh, yes, I'm. This animal is about from your fingertips to your elbow. That's the total length of this animal. This is unreal. This is unreal. This is unreal. This is like now my fourth Christmas in a week. <laughs> we should do this more often. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. Welcome back everyone. Well we've been following those male leopard tracks. They walked along Philemon's cut line and uh, then they cut south. They haven't come out yet. So I'm just going to have a look. If they don't come out here I'm going to go back to the last track. Go and have a look. That's sort of towards Treehouse Dam, but um, the general direction is west. Followed the hyena drag mark of a carcass for quite some time. Okay, so if his tracks don't come out here, yeah, then he's either... Ooh, there's a Steenbock. Hello, Steenbock. Have you seen a 
May a leopard? No, I haven't. Where? Where is there a male leopard? Somewhere around here lurks a male leopard. Little female, stand very still and you won't see me. That's their strategy. Works very well, as you can tell. We see depth, we see colour. We're able to pick them out of the bushes, but um, and they're not easily seen. And it feels like it's been spotted, it can run off very quickly, short distance, and stand still again. Felicia Dakers are a little bit bigger. Um, they've got a very obvious preorbital gland under the eye, the uh, Dacre. They've got a mohawk. Um, and they're more grey in colour. Steenbock has got more of a sort of orangey coat. Steenbock do favour more sort of semi open woodland, whereas Dacre like it a little bit more closed. Very similar in their behaviour, very similar in their feeding. Although Dacre don't do much digging. Steenbock are well known for digging. Dacre deposit a whole lot of pellets on the floor. Steenbock deposit pellets but then bury them. Dacre got a very long sort of nose. This mohawk, both male and female. Or well, both male have horns in this Dacre and Steenbock and the female do not. Just like that. Vanished. Tracks are sort of heading this way. Oh, there's the male. Got him. Trevor, it's anything's possible with the wind. Last night, anything's possible. If it is Tingana, I don't know. By the tracks, it's hard to tell. I mean, it's most likely him, but um, could be Mawati. But uh, Mawati, we don't know if Mawati walks through our camp. And that leopard walks straight through our camp, which Tingana and Asana used to do a lot. Tavangumi, maybe? Male leopard, everyone. Male leopard. Until we find the tracks, or the animal, not the tracks, the animal. I couldn't tell you anymore. But if his mindset was to go to Triast Dam, he would have gone straight through, past the dense site on Taxon's Road. So the general direction was west. So if he doesn't come through here, I'm gonna go back to the last track. He might have somehow got across the road. There were a lot of wildebeest there that I think had moved away from quarantine because of his presence earlier. We might find this leopard lying up a treehouse down. I think Trish was on her way there as well, so sorry Trish. The tracks are leading me in that direction. Lovely and warm already. Cloud cover. Bush babies, yes. otters have been seen. There was an otter on the dam cam a few months ago. It's actually recorded by one of the zoomies. I had a look at the video and I Confirmed it indeed, Cape Clawless Otter. Um, they like riverine areas with lots of moisture, lots of water. But they can move through to these areas from more permanent rivers. So the Sand River, the Olifants River, the Levuva River, you'll find otters all the time. And uh, when the seasons are good and the water is able to flow in all the other streams, well, they're very mobile. I had a couple of otters on the on the Orange River when I was up there. It was very cool. Very special animal to see, the otter. There we 
go. That hyena. That's a lion. This is from the other day. Dark mane actually um, have tracks of a male lion coming down. Hyenas, hyenas, hyenas. And Doc is being fresh to here. Is Franklin not happy? May a lion came through. Dark man is on a mission, everybody. There was a track here that looked like a leopard, but I think it was maybe just one of the spotted hyenas. Okay, so Dark Man has gone that way. Probably came and had a drink and went around. I don't know, maybe he's on a, a mission to find his brothers. He's done with the Telemates for a little while. He seems to be on some territorial movements. I'll let Lex know he was interested to see where this male lion track went to. Okay, we're going to just send you over to Trish, who I'm sure is just around the corner. Cut. Welcome back everybody, sorry about that drop in signal, um, what I'm doing is I told you I heard that line that was roaring earlier this morning, so I'm kind of on my way to where I heard it, it was probably about 20 minutes ago or so, but on the way it's really worth it, I was talking yesterday about how this leopard is now denning, this female leopard is denning in and around the river, so I've taken this tributary that I last night, driving now into the main river.
behavior. But that's not to say if there weren't roads, they wouldn't know what to do. They also make game parts. Animals make game parts in the blocks. I'm just gonna see if I come across one, I'll show it to you. Imagine that it's like a footpath that we have. They're very, very obvious. And they've got no grass in them and they're a line because they're just constantly used by animals. And I mean like over years and years and years. For that same reason. Get from one place to the other without without having to put up with any kind of resistance from the vegetation. But this here is here's a game path. Just this line here. There, see that line there? And that's a game path. Not one that's used very often, but it's still a game path. Very cool. Least resistance. Anyway, it seems that Steve Wolf has had some luck, so why don't you go over and see? back and good morning and everybody how are we doing we have uh, tracked the mail line tracks all the way along Gary Main still heading west and we just encountered this herd of elephants here feeding on a fallen over marula tree Those leopard tracks haven't come out, so we're going to head back slowly into that area. The tracks of this male lion definitely indicate it's dark man, and he does this from time to time. Do a big boundary patrol. Yeah, the elephants are enjoying some marula bark. Is that nice, Mama? Jerome elephants, females stay in the herd for life unless the herd eventually splits into a few smaller groups. Males will get kicked out. They just don't get tolerated anymore, their behavior. But they'll often spend time following the females, following the herd. keeping close tabs on what's going on. Male in the back there is completely destroyed this marula tree that was already damaged. It was already damaged. There's insect damage already elephant damage to it which led to insects and water damage. Pretty rotten in its core already.
Franks is going to show us how to push over a tree. He's reliving the act. many different ways Lily Pan they can use their tusks as leverage or they just stick the entire branch in their mouth and see how she responds to this bull she moves out of his way mine He's not a fully grown bull, he's got lots of time still. Curse okay, so sniff. Female, she's not interested. But I broke this tree for you. Now it feels a bit of rejection. <laughs> Caption that, eh? <laughs> so some of those really big branches will just get left as they are. Some of the big ones will um can be put in the mouth lt is too young he's too young to have been the father he's not a fully grown male he's still young he's got a lot of time to go still before he becomes a mature bull you could see he was just a little bit bigger than her big males are oh, enormous in comparison to the guys giving the other one a hard time now another female you see how she He's pretty much the same size as her, so he's not a fully grown male. He's only in his early 20s. Full of nonsense. Big enough to push over a tree, though. Show how strong he is and how impressive he is. But, um, well, these ladies aren't interested. Starting here, James. Everything's very calm. to chew on. See if she breaks a larger branch. Thinking about it. Let's see if she does it. She's going to use her foot. Testing. Task for leverage. Like a gun 
and shot. Quite happy with her break. Now she's going to stick that entire piece of wood in her mouth. Oh, she's actually going to try to strip it a little bit. Do you dream of an African holiday in unparalleled luxury? Where your days are spent in the company of wildlife and cooling off in your very own plunge pool? Well, this month's prize may be the one for you. Expertly camouflage into the unspoiled environment of the world-famed Sabi Sand Game Reserve. It's hard not to fall in love with Simbambili. Sign up to be a wild earth explorer before the end of May and you and a friend could be jetting off to this ultimate escape from reality. A luxurious safari and spa getaway wrapped up in one impressive package. Wild earth explorers, it's in your nature. Our bodies are made up of about 60% water, which means that in a very short space of time, you can dehydrate completely. A relatively efficient way of collecting water early in the morning is to take an absorbent material like a sock and to walk through the grass absorbing the condensed dewdrops on the grass. Once the material is saturated, you can then squeeze it out into a container or you can suck it out directly into your mouth. I love being a cam up for wild earth. The animals coming right up close to you, especially like lions. Sometimes you get nervous, but you have to go with the flow. <laughs> My favorite animal to film is the elephant because of how big it is. But when it's really up close to you, it's one animal that you would say, I really respect you. Guys, have a look at what we've got. This is better than my birthday. Look at that. This is the first time that I ever see cubs this small. Th this is so special. This has officially just become my best sighting of all times. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. So I'm keeping it on the straight and smooth roads for now. My car sounds a little bit strange, so I'll check it out in a bit. 
once we stop but I'm just keeping it to you the boundaries for now. So we're on Buffelsick boundary at the moment and then we're going to take Gallego shortcut to the central portions of Juma again. I'm doing that because I know of a chameleon that lives there and I like to see them when they're during the day. So last night, it seemed that those those lionesses continued to move north and they did have a sighting with them. But they moved north pretty much from this area. But at least we got a glimpse of them yesterday. Anyway, let me send you over to Dan and in Gala and see what he's getting up to. Welcome back everybody. Charlotte, I really hope you do get lucky with some lionesses this morning. We were lucky enough to find this one male lion. I'm pretty sure it was the same one that we heard roaring from early this morning. And it is it makes your life a little bit easier when lions are a big yawn. Makes it a bit easier when lions are roaring. Oh, are you gonna get up? The bar might get in the way shortly. So it's one of the Ross males. And he has been lying down there for some time. Interesting, I wonder if he hasn't heard something. There he comes this side. Let me get my head out the way, sorry. How's the colour of the grass at the moment and the colour of this? Oh, there was a cuckoo. Jacobin cuckoo that just flew past. That's unusual, they shouldn't be here at the moment. Um, how's the colour of the grass blending in when he was lying down there? So we kind of drove down to where we thought we heard the roaring and we saw lion tracks going off the road. Luckily he was quite close. I wouldn't want to be walking in here because without even trying to hide he is super hidden. Okay, if you guys are keen, let's see if we can follow him. It's not a terrible area. There is some, there are some openings not so far away from here that there might be some general game. Although I don't think he's necessarily on the hunt. I wonder if he didn't maybe hear his brother calling in the distance that got him up and encouraged him to move. Super thick area to begin with, but he is heading in the direction of a beautiful clearing. Actually, the other day I watched, it's quite interesting, and because I haven't been here for some time, I'm trying to like puzzle together what's been happening since I've been gone with the lion dynamics. And it seems as if these Ross males are really in the frame of mind of chasing the young sub-adult males, including the white one, away from the pride. And they're doing so quite aggressively, actually. I mean, I think you guys looked at them yesterday and that white male had quite a few cuts and bruises from one of these males and was bleeding from its shoulder. It's just how it goes at the moment. And they are at the age when they're gonna get chased away. I will be so interested to see if they don't get chased away with the, with that young Birmingham male. Okay, so he's kind of stopping and turning around here. This might be a good chance for us to get past and try and put us into a position where he might walk past us if we're very lucky. Okay, so he's walking right in front of us on a little bit of a mission. You'll often see him stop. He did stop at that bush there. He kind of rubbed his face up there, marking his territory. He did turn around and spray urine. Lisa, wow, he is beautiful. I agree with you, particularly when he's moving through here and he's like, he's really commanding the place. He's got, he's not worried about too much. He knows what's, he's fairly confident with what's coming up ahead of him. You even heard some gray go away birds alarm calling up ahead here. And you'll see he will be responsive to alarm calls like that. He will get up and because he's pretty much the, the dominant lion and the dominant predator in the area, whatever the predator is that those um, go away birds are alarming at, he'll be able to outcompete. So he's not too, so I just want to drive around this termite mound and not over it, just be as sensitive as I can. There we go, around it. 
Um, and if it is a leopard or something that those go-away birds are shouting at, it might be that the leopard is moving around, maybe it's caught some food, and if it has, this lion will move through and steal that food as well. Whether it be a hyena as well, Although, oh, there's an impala right there. Let's see what this impala does if it sees this lion. Let's just get into the right position. Give me two minutes. Okay, so here comes the lion. There's an impala. Oh, listen, listen, listen. There it goes. So keep listening out for that impala alarm calling. They're very close to one another. So these, this impala is probably 15 meters, 10 meters from this lion, just watching. The lion's obviously not in a hunting mode. The element of surprise is gone. Look at that, eh? Just saying, I see you. And there's no point in coming for me. Let me duck my head down. You'll see hyenas will also respond to that alarm call. See how he puts his head down like that? I wonder if he's not on the trail of some other lions. Look at the, the impala is now trotting towards the lion to make sure that it doesn't go out of the lion's sight. That's my head in the way again. And that comes trots toward the lion, making sure that he can still see it. It's like the, the enemy that you can see is better than the enemy you can't see. And you'll see it'll do the lion a disservice, particularly if he was hunting, to have this alarm call going on. Oh, more alarm calls up ahead there. So that impala will warn everyone around here that there is danger, including our souls, other predators, but the lion's not too worried. So I was saying he is the, the dominant one around here, and he's not really worried about hunting and moving around for now. He's more worried about getting from point A to point B. We know where point A is. We now need to just work out where point B is. So even if I stop here, you can see that lion is walking right towards the second impala. And that first impala's alarm calls would have brought the attention towards it. And you can now watch him watch it. So it's not a really good hunting opportunity because that, li that impala is incredibly quick and agile. And for that lion to launch an attack from there and successfully catch it would be incredibly difficult and an, a, probably a waste of energy. However, if these impalas, it is the end of the look at him stopping in that tree, turning around, scent marking, asserting his dominance. It'll be interesting to see if he calls. We heard him call once this morning. I might have been driving around when he was roaring again, in which case I wouldn't have heard him. Okay, I'm gonna try and see if we can get around again. Yeah, there's this impala still walking forward towards where that lion is going. Hey, there you are. He wants to make sure that he can see him the whole time, that, he beca that he's no longer a threat. The lion knows just how athletic these impala are. I mean, these males, that was a male there, and there was a male in front of the lion earlier as well. It is the end of the rutting season, and they kind of still going at each other, pushing and competing, snorting, grunting, running around. If one of them carelessly kind of chased another one into the path of this lion, he has a whole lot of female impalas. They're just watching. The lion's obviously ahead of us, just watching him very carefully. He's just kind of gone into the bush. You can see him there. He's probably stopped. Listen to the alarm calls. Lots of them. Look at the impalas on the right as well. See how focused they are on where that lion's going and what it's doing. Okay, he's just gone out of my line of sight. I'm going to try and keep him in. I'm going to be like these impalas and try and keep an eye on him because if I do lose him for even a few seconds, if he changes direction or if he goes into some long grass, we may lose him. He is super camouflaged. Oopsie.
Okay, he's still going. Yo, he's on a mission. Scent marking. Try and squeeze some paw in the camera through here. Lala, I found how old are the Ross males. So they've obviously come from a different property, so they weren't born here. However, they're older than when I when I first got here. I thought they were probably around six or seven, which was about sure, almost three and a half, four years ago. Almost, yeah, three and a half years ago. And apparently they're around 11 years old. We got a little bit of info from somebody in the Timbavati as to where they've come from. And apparently they're around 11 years old. And to be honest with you, that's quite, it's like reaching the prime for a male lion. And here he goes. 11 years old, they often live to around 10 or 11. So it's, one would expect after reading a book that they're coming to the end of their, their reign. But to be honest with you, I've never seen them look stronger, better, or more dominant. They seem like they're only just really kicking into their prime, which is amazing to see. It's it's going to be really good for the the survival and the, the expansion of the Birmingham Pride, which is really good. And it's got to the stage where his first set of young males is already being chased away. I was simply chatting about how the young white lion and his siblings are watch the trees and pull. Watch the camera, try not to break that me. And yeah, so they've done fantastically well already. And for two male lions, they, they've overtaken from the previous males that were five. To have such a big dominant territory for just two of them is quite, quite amazing and remarkable, in fact. And you'll see, they, we often see them on their own, kind of like they are now. And I've just put ourselves in a little bit of a dead corner here. You see them on their own simply because they use each other to cover as much distance as they possibly can. The best contribution that they have to this pride and ensuring its survival, and I'm poor, I'm gonna ask you to just duck and dive here if I can. The best things that they can do to ensure the survival of the pride is to actually patrol the territory. The biggest threat to another lion is, or a lion is another lion. Just make sure all our equipment's all in the right place. Everybody fine? Cool, seems to be good. <laughs> um, the biggest threat to a lion is another lion. And what this male will do is ensure that other lions aren't coming in. So between the brothers, they'll patrol the territory and they will scent mark, like you've seen him scent marking this morning, scent marking, scent marking, roaring, advertising his presence, ensuring that there are no other competitors or other lions coming in. And if another lion does come in, they're going to be sure to know that they're coming in at their peril or that they're going to have resistance waiting for them. Okay, so this has given us a good opportunity, nice and open here to get around. Let's see if we can't get him to walk right towards us again. Interesting to see this beautiful clearing here. There's often lots of general game. I was hoping to see maybe some more impalas. I wonder if they didn't hear those previous alarm calls and kind of respond accordingly. See, sorry. Let's see, we'll leave it up to him as to where he wants to walk. Right up, you see how he rubs his face up against the scent marking wherever he's going. Looks like he could do with a meal. He's not out of condition, but he hasn't eaten last night or maybe something tiny. And you'll see in the process of this kind of territory patrol, making sure that there aren't other lions coming in, he can cover huge distances and that can use up a lot of energy. Just make him pause life a little bit easier here and reverse a bit. Our beard, it's an interesting time for the line dynamics of this pride, and you did right. I'm gonna do one more loop around here. Um, it's fascinating, and it's one of my favorite things about lines that there's 
you think you can predict what's going on, but there's actually very, oh, he's just going to flop down there like that, are you? You think you can predict what's going on, but actually your guess might be as good as mine or somebody else's because you're never really going to know. Even once it's happened, you're never guaranteed to know exactly why or what happened. And I mean, at the moment, the pride is scattered all over the show. A few months ago, I was mentioning how there was competition from all around. The Mayan Bula Pride was coming in on the east and Buru Pride was coming in on the south. Um, the breakaway pride, even at the moment, last night, they were seen coming right into the middle of the Birmingham territory. The Ross males are also in charge of the, the breakaway pride, though, so it's not the end of the world. But there were eight young males with the breakaways last night, which I haven't seen for a long time. Now, that's going to be a formidable coalition. Then you've got the lionesses, the females, who have all got cubs at the moment. They are also quite far north. So the, Bir the Birmingham Pride is all over the show. Then you've got the young subadult males who are in the process of being quite aggressively chased away by this Ross male and his brother. So it's fascinating and very interesting. And as I was saying, it's almost like these, these Ross males are in the prime. They are seeming to be the most dominant that they've been and looking almost really good or better than they have in many, many years. This, this male here, he did have a, a small yawn earlier and he's lost one of his canines. We were talking about his age and being a close to 11 or so. So being a reasonably old male lion, you will see these dominant predators with age start to lose their teeth. Um, he's only lost one, as far as I'm aware. And he will lose their teeth. That will make hunting more difficult. It will also make eating more difficult but he might lose it in a fight, maybe with his brother or even around a carcass with serious competition. Now that he's settled down, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time with him. It seems like he has got a little bit of a mission, maybe listening to around to see if there aren't any other lions calling. And while I sit here, I'm gonna send you over to Trish. I'm sure that was an awesome sighting. Yeah, things are a little bit slow, but I'm now going to where I had found a comedian previously to see if we managed to get a nice sighting of it this time. It was a very, very cool comedian. Last time I saw it, it was spotty. It had black little spots all over it. And it's a flat-necked chameleon. It's called flat-necked because it's neck bit. It can inflate the neck and it, you can see it kind of look like, looks like flaps. So it's called a flat-necked chameleon, but you can't usually see it unless the animal decides to show it to you. And what's nice is that the color of those flaps, once it's uh, inflated it, it's usually got a different color in the throat. So last time it was had black spots and orange between the flaps. For me, that would indicate that, uh, indicate that it's uh, just had a confrontation with something. Uh, but we were in the car at the time, so it wasn't us. But it definitely was feeling a little bit defensive when we arrived. So I wonder what, maybe it saw another comedian. Anyway, it's somewhere here on the left. It's amazing how you can know which tree out of the how many millions of trees you see every day one can be on never mind how how much they all will look the same still gets me though I think it's this tree and no it's the next tree that looks like this tree it's not this tree but it looks like this tree wait let's check this tree I think it was this tree, the small one. I haven't seen it for a day or so, so it could have gone by now to a different tree. That's a red bush willow. Hmm. 
Well, maybe I got the wrong tree. As I keep moving through, you can see it's a very generic looking tree. But uh, we're gonna keep looking. I'm gonna send you over to Pridelands in the meantime. Good morning and welcome back to Bushwalk. We're just admiring these beautiful clouds at the moment. There's a big cold front that hit the low felt and it's definitely affected most of the activity of the animals in today. Especially when we've got cold temperatures like this combined with wind, we often find that animals will go and lie flat down to prevent that wind chill factor influences them drastically. Well, we've also been looking at some of the damage in this area, which has been created by elephants. Onto our left-hand side over here, there's a tree that's been pushed over by an elephant. And elephants go for a number of different parts of the plants. They do go for roots, they also go for bark, flowers, fruits and seeds. And they will also deliberately feed on different parts of a plant at different times of the year. So, so if we pan a little bit over here, there's also a few more telltale field signs that we would like to share with you that elephant has been in the area. Other than just looking at their tracks, we also find right over here at the base of this tree a large amount of elephant dung that has been deposited. And then on this tree itself, we can notice how the elephants were using their tusks to strip off the layers of bark. And what they were after is actually the inner layer of the bark, which is responsible for the transportation of nutrients and minerals. And meanwhile, we're going to hand you over to Steve and see what he has found. Well, welcome back everyone. We left our elephants with their destroyed tree and we went back to the last tracks of the male leopard. And uh, we tried really hard, but um, we were, <laughs> obviously we were able to find him. Tingana. So he moved into the block. We had his track crossing the road and I came back to the last track from before where I'd made a mark. We came around the block, didn't come out. And then obviously we found those male lion tracks. We're following them for a little bit to check the boundary. There was no male leopard track going out. We left our Ellie's, came back to last track. And when I looked from the last track at the angle, I saw this termite mound about 50 meters off the road. And there he was, doing what he does best, doing what leopards do best, termite mounds. I don't see a little warthog burrow nearby, but it's possible he might have thought there was one. The Duke of Juma. How fitting, everybody. My first drive on Juma was with Tingana. And my last morning. How fitting. He's been around. I think he came to say hello last night because he walked right through our camp at about quarter to nine. About nine o'clock actually. Some very upset nyalas. He's got some blood on his neck there. He's a beast, isn't he? He's a very impressive leopard, everybody. Very impressive.
He is, Lisa. He is, and he's looking as regal as he always has, sitting on top of a termite mount. How many times have I spent time with him sitting on a throne like this one? It's not the biggest termite mount, but it'll do. Not certain, Craig. Um, depends on what animals, I suppose. Leopards or leopards and lions will eat whenever they can. I don't think there's uh, more or less. You know, there's opportunity. Alarm calls to the south of me now. Was that a male impala? See, he's interested. Herbivore animals. Um, they have a thorough put to time of food going in. Elephants, for example, are constantly eating. doesn't matter the time of the year. They just get maximum out of the vegetation that they can when they can. But it's always a very poor digestion. So I think we as humans eat more in the winter because we are more homebound. We're more sort of closeted away. But I don't think... <laughs> That's hard to say, really. Look left. <laughs> Steve, Steve. Belit Kalamba, we're not, I'm not sure where she is at the moment. Now, morning, Lauren, you drove past about 50 meters. We're just on the southern side of the road. Just come back 50 meters and find access. Salamba is obviously the princess. It's really hard to say. I mean, we called Chidulu the Duchess of the West. Um, Tlalamba is the soon-to-be queen. But um, I don't know. All of these interesting names. The Duke of Juma just rolls up the tongue, doesn't it? Tlalamba is um, reigning. She's taking over from her mom, and she's definitely cementing herself here in Juma which will be nice. Nice to see her. I'm going to see if I can find her this afternoon. vehicle coming to join us. so famous. So many people around the world love this gentleman. Let's have a little one-word tweet from all of you out there, shall we? How does it make you feel seeing Tingana looking so good? I've seen him, seen him a few times this week. Doing really well. Had him hunting. 
killing a day cat, getting an impala right close to camp, losing it to hyenas because he didn't tree it. And now once again sitting all regal-like on top of his throne. Let us know how it makes you feel. If it's more than one word, that's okay. I feel quite honoured. Made me work yesterday, Tingi. I was very close to finding him, but it's just hidden away. Honoured Raphael, indeed, me too. Sir Tingi, <laughs> the Duke of Juma. Overwhelming, Judith. Hmm, you like that one. Thanks for letting, you, letting me find you this morning, allowing me to find you. We're not going anywhere everybody, we're going to just sit chat and soak us all up. Fascinating and charismatic, these scaly skinned mammals are one of the world's most elusive creatures. Here are some unique facts about pangolins. Pangolins have long, sticky tongues that can grow up to a third of their body length. This is to help scoop up their prey. Pangolins walk on their knuckles so they can protect their claws. A baby pangolin is called a pango pup and it rides on its mother's back for the first year of its life. A pangolin is the most heavily trafficked wild mammal in the world and is seriously threatened by extinction. Join four leading conservation specialists live on Saturday, June 5th as they discuss this unique animal and the threats it is faced with. Take 27. I'm Carol from Chicago, USA. This is me five years ago. No music, no editing, real time. I was hooked. Thank you so much for that, Wild Earth. I had lost my job and I also lost one of my pets. So Wild Earth has seen me through very hard times. And I just want to thank all of you for being there for me when I needed you most. We love you, we start and end our day with you, teaching our grandkids all about nature through you, your wonderful educational safaris. We really do appreciate being on safari with you, especially when it's cold and wintry in Canada. And considering we've been in lockdown for 18 months here in Saudi and have not been able to fly back to South Africa, I want to thank you for bringing your safari back into my life every single day and night. I love it, love it, love it. My name is Lauren and I'm currently working in Juma Private Game Reserve here in South Africa. I love answering your questions during the live safaris. It's my favorite part. It feels like you're on the vehicle with me and I'm able to teach you exactly what you want to know. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, you must go to the live safari page and ask your question below the live feed. Welcome back everybody. Now, after following this male lion for the past couple of hundred meters, he kind of flopped himself down right in the middle of these clearings. So he's not very well hidden at all. Not that he's too worried about being hidden. You saw those impalas earlier, alarm calling at him, watching him very closely. But he 
might be just taking a rest. When he did stop, he looked super interested in what's coming up ahead of us, so behind us and ahead of him. I wonder what's got his attention this morning. I wonder if he isn't hearing something that we can't. Obviously, lions have got incredibly sensitive and acute hearing compared to us. He also seemed at one point to put his nose down to the ground. So he might have picked up on the scent of some other lions maybe that are moving through the area here, in which case he would be following them quite closely trying to at least and that nose of his will take him he'll follow them follow his nose until he finds them and at the moment it seems like he's just looking for the young males in the pride kind of put them under a lot of pressure encouraging them to leave pushing them out pushing them out to be on their own which just isn't an easy time young males that kind of leave on their own the age of about two and a half that the sub adults are at at the moment they're not very good hunters. They're not very confident hunters. And they don't know any area other than their own territory that they've been moving around for the past two and a half years. So it can be a tricky, daunting time for them. But it's part of what needs to happen. It's actually how these lions ensure, oh, that's a sign that he might be spending some more time here than we were hoping or thinking, or that he suggested as well when he first got you. You should have seen him, he put his head up and you'll see your face right into the wind. And the wind will kind of carry all sorts of scents along it, whether it be a prey sense, a scent, a sense of other lions. Even if other lions are roaring in that dis distance, if the wind is blowing from there, the roar will travel much further. It'll kind of travel along the wind. He's not gonna smell the roar, he'll listen to it but that might give him a better clue and he'll get up and walk straight towards where he thought it was coming from, then stop, listen again for in the next few minutes, see if he can't more accurately pinpoint where that roar is coming from, or maybe the smell that he picked up on. Nova, any news on the missing sub-adult male? From as far as I'm aware, not yet, eh? We are constantly looking, and it's quite tricky to follow these sub-adult males at the moment, just because there is this pressure from this male. And this morning he was roaring. Those no, sub-adult males will be listening very carefully, and they'll be trying to avoid him as much as they can. They'll also be trying to sneak closer to the pride. That's their comfort. Their mothers, their cousins are all there, and... They'll try as often as they can to try and sneak a meal in once in a while. But it's not easy when you've got your your fathers or these male lions constantly on your case. Trying to find you, trying to chase you. And if they, they do manage to catch up, I don't think they're necessarily going to try and kill them. But they will often hurt them and it can be quite severe from time to time. And you don't really want an injury out here, whether it be to a paw or a shoulder or a jaw. I mean, this is also the less dominant Ross male. He's the one with the blonde male, slightly smaller than his brother, but still incredibly dominant and can be very dangerous as well to the sub-adults. But no, I haven't seen that missing sub-adult yet. We're still kind of looking for him. I mean, now that it's not a it's not a very sunny day, we were talking about how overcast it was this morning, and that actually made it nice and warm. It insulated the heat from last night and kept us warm this morning. The problem with it, though, is that it takes quite a long time to warm up from that initial temperature, and we're kind of dealing with that at the moment. It also means that it's not really going to be too hot anytime soon, which means this lion's got no reason to move from here if he's happy to sleep. You'll see if it was going to be a hot day, it's already 8 o'clock. You might be trying to move to a more shady spot. But for now, very happy. And you can see, even when he's lying down here, this is a very open area. There's not much cover around, but as he lies down flat, the grass is reasonably short, but still kind of covering him in the perfect color for him to disappear. Even his mane, this is the lighter colored 
main or lighter colored main dross mail and his mane is perfectly colored to this grass. It's not a very good opportunistic place to be lying. I mean, lions are inherently opportunistic and if he was lying in the bush, it might give him a bit of an element of surprise without even trying too hard. And then an impala that might be rutting or chasing each other around. Or there are a few buffalo bulls around. Though it's not far away from where we saw that herd yesterday. Maybe some of the older buffaloes have watched this male kill a buffalo on his own, in fact, which is pretty tricky and not easy. And yeah, if he gets the opportunity to do that, he will, particularly if it's an injured older male. Well, see, he's taking a chance of injuring himself, but he will take any chance or any opportunity that he gets. Now that this lion has kind of put his head down and catching up on some sleep and probably going to rest in and around this area for some time, I'm going to keep going in the way that he was looking, seeing if we can't find anything that was attracting his attention. And then I'll send you over to Steve while I do that. Tengala's on the move. Let us keep up with him. He's heading towards uh, those alarm calls or those impala male rutting sounds. It's about to come out onto the access of Treehouse Dam, I believe. That's why we checked it earlier to see if he uh, did come out. But the dam's just at the bottom there. So it's possible he's going to head straight down towards the water or walk across. You'll notice now if he hits the road, he's probably going to walk straight across it or along it. Maybe go up another term up now. Busy sniffing interested to see what he does from a territorial point of view. Haven't really seen him on the move apart from the other day when he was missioning for a hunt. Investigating all the smells going on around. We've often seen termite mounds used by all of our cats. Good place to leave a little sign, a little note. tracks on top of my vehicle tracks. Straight towards Treehouse Dam. How cool is that? Zola, is there a reason why the ears are black? Well, when you see them from behind, it makes them more obvious for a cub. Lions have definitely got that purpose of uh, dark ears at the back, so as to follow, help to follow. The intention is quite clear, and the tail and a leopard for following the adults, the, the cubs following the adult. But from the back, it makes it very obvious. From the front, they're invisible. Camouflage. And here the birds are shouting. Can they smell something? listening at the same time. Okay, I'm just going to pull up on the side there, Darby. We'll get a nice little view of him walking. We do have another vehicle in the sighting, so give them a bit of an opportunity as well to, to see him moving.
Christmas. You can see once again, everyone, why we check the roads. So when we came around to check the site, I was seeing if he didn't come out because he would have. They just can't help themselves. They hit a major game path slash road and they have to move with it. Game paths often lead to water. Nice thoroughfares. You can see all the elephant dung as well. Still nice and overcast, so nice and cool for him to be moving. <laughs> so it will not be a good outcome. I think many people would like to give Tingana a little hug. But uh, it would not would not end very well. <laughs> it does look like a teddy bear, doesn't he? Okay, so we definitely have the opportunity following him for him to successfully hunt again. But uh, you never know. You never know what can happen with leopards and lions on the move. They're always looking for something to snack on. Success rate is normally quite low. But as he gets closer and closer to the water here, he'll start becoming more and more vigilant. Just gonna wait for him to get around the corner. And we're gonna pull over again. This is having a little sniff. Another signpost. There we go, he's busy sniffing. Oh, he's got an injury on his paw. The right front. Hammond, do I have a favorite memory with Tingana? It's just a bit of blood there, just up on the wrist, below the dew claw. I'm trying to think, there's so many. So many times with him. Dobby, do you have one that springs to mind? I remember watching him feed on a python. <laughs> I remember, Dobby remembers him on a python, and hoisting a python. I think what I've thoroughly enjoyed about Tingana is the amount of times I've seen him interact with his cubs with Hosanna and with Tlalamba. It's just been like crazy, you know, how many times he's stolen their kills, been very tolerant of them. That time when uh, I wasn't in the sighting, but that time Tlalamba bopped him on the nose in a tree on a kill, I thought that was pretty special. My introduction to him was uh, finding him in a pan, watching him sit there, and then Hosanna just waltzed along. And he just accepted him. Hosanna played the game of submissive male. Tagana just allowed him to approach. They went through all of the, the telltale signs of dominant versus subordinate. And I know the viewers were telling me the names of these two leopards, and I was on my interview. Now it's like the bigger one and the smaller one. Okay, we're going to quickly zoom around and go onto the dam wall and we get a view of him having a drink. We should do anyway. Yeah. He might actually go all the way around that the dam now. We're gonna have to keep our eyes open. Sorry, Darby. Tree house dam. Tingana, the male leopard. Quenching his thirst.
Now, isn't that a picture? I remember once uh, picking up his tracks on Sandy Patch. It was after my, just after my first oh my word moment when everybody thinks that we never see these cats on foot. And um, I was tracking him and I walked into this block and he was standing on top of a termite mound, not far away, and he just looked at me, his typical tingy look, and then he looked straight down into the warthog hole that he'd been standing over for the last, I don't know how long, but then he proceeded to stand there for the next three hours, the same spot, staring in. Um, before I went to the Mara, oh, we've got some amazing photos that day, before I went to the Mara, I think for my second time, at Tingana in the drainage line here on Elephant Carcass where he was sitting on top of a termite mound very calmly. I was with Senzo and then all of a sudden a warthog came out of the burrow and he jumped on it and killed it pretty quickly. It happened so fast. He was, he was napping, seemingly fast asleep. But the warthog specialist, which are male leopards, descended on that warthog and it was over his I was having so much fun, in fact, I forgot I was actually supposed to be on a plane that evening and had to uh, completely get my ticket changed. Such is um, the fun of being out in the wilderness, spending time with these magnificent animals. He does know it, doesn't he? He does know he's the best. He's been around. He's been through it all. And he's still here. And he's putting up a show for us here on the last morning. My last morning. The last that we see him moving like this and get shots of Tikana doing this. It's been some time. doing the catwalk and now he's pretty much going to pop out where Dark Main's tracks popped out on the southern treehouse road but he is heading in the general direction to where those male and parlor were shouting a little while ago so let him just give himself a good chest lick it's always important to get the chest nice and <laughs> nice and lubricated before moving through the, the long grass let's uh We'll go around and see if we can pick up on him on the side. So you get to learn the patterns and the pathways. So we didn't find his tracks on that road before, but we still came and checked here. That's when we found Dark Man's tracks and the Dark Man's tracks again over here. These animals, they, they walk on very particular routes. As Trish was talking about earlier in the show, it's just, it's just these game paths that uh, they follow. And he is definitely looking for something to snack on. the game path we were going to check. Oh, he's going to go straight south in this game path, straight to where we last heard the Impala. Haven't heard them since, but I think he triangulated their position.
On board, we have a very special guest joining our live safari today. We have Sue Fogel, who has bought a ticket to Dream. It was an easy decision to purchase a ticket to Dream because I've been working with animals for my whole life. And I think what Wild Earth uh, does here, bringing live safaris into your home, is just remarkable. If you want to go on safari with a Wild Earth guide, whilst honing your bush knowledge, and of course featuring in one of our shows, then head over to our website. Well, since I've been watching for such a long time, I thought it would be a good idea for me to come here in person. Sign up to be a Wild Earth Explorer and you could be making your first ever on-screen appearance. If you have a chance to do it, I highly recommend it. Um, to feel the sun on your face and the wind in your hair and to smell the smells and just kind of be in the animal's presence. It's indescribable. I highly recommend it. For many years, Wild Earth has taken viewers from around the world to the Mara Triangle, a place of majestic beauty and abundant wildlife. But it wasn't always like this. Before 2001, it was infested with poachers. Illegal harvesting and hunting was rife. Now the situation couldn't be more different. The hard work and dedication of the Mara Conservancy has revolutionized this magical land. But now, the loss of revenue from tourism has created a grave crisis. The Mara Conservancy needs help if they are to continue protecting the reserve and supporting the local communities whose livelihood depend on its survival. It's a huge privilege to be in these incredible places with these amazing animals. I love forming lions. When they do get up and do something, it's always spectacular. When they are playing, are incredibly fun to watch, especially sub and cubs. I love being in the bush and working in these incredible places with these amazing animals. We want to bring it to you so that you can almost feel like you're right there and be able to experience it and enjoy it the way we do. Welcome back everybody, Tan Beyond and Gala here and we've just popped into the riverbed and amazingly there's, there was a herd of elephants but now there's a few, it looks like a few younger bulls at the back that are drinking in fact and we did discuss this and chat on it a little bit yesterday about how this dry river system is dry but the underground water flow is still very apparent and very prominent. You see there's four of them there, the one with its legs like kind of below the level of the ground essentially and what would have happened was very likely the matriarch or one of the bigger cows would have come through here and she'll use her front front legs to kind of dig a hole to get to water look at this one like right in the water you see it might use its left leg there to kind of pull some sand out of the way and it's not not a very hot day so far and i don't think it's going to be a hot day so they're very likely simply drinking. They're not wetting themselves, they're not cooling themselves down. They are simply drinking. And when you drink, or when you use your legs and you kind of move the sand away, the sand almost acts as like a filter. So she'll, they'll move it out, move it out, and then they'll use their trunks to kind of suck up a whole lot of sand, drop it on the side, and then get to some really clean, fresh water. It looks like that hole might only be big enough for one elephant at a time. So a few of them are kind of pushing around, waiting for their turn till they can get in there to have a drink. And it does look like there are a few younger bulls in there and they can often be quite playful and quite boisterous, throwing the sand on top of each other, kind of pushing and shoving, using their tusks to kind of poke the other one sometimes in the backside to make some space. But you'll see this riverbed is a real good place to see elephants. Firstly, when you pop into the riverbed, you've obviously got this wide view to see what's going on around you. Then on the banks, there's lots of foliage, lots of food, lots of beautiful trees, lots of grass. And an elephant doesn't have to worry too much about it. You see that? Lots of... Okay, so obviously there's a second hole there as well. That elephant kind of just picked up its trunk like that. And you see how it kind of 
throws it around, it's very likely getting rid of some of the sandy water, trying to get to some of the more pure water that hasn't got so much sand or dirt in it. Might be a bit tricky, but even for ourselves, if I were to walk up to that hole after these elephants, be very... Sorry, I thought I heard a lion roaring there. Be very easy for me to go and have a drink there. Be nice and clean. Cleaner than the water in the dams at the moment. The dams are actually... There's lots of nutrition and that is kind of building up on the sides of the dam, creating kind of like this green algae and slime that doesn't look so appealing. So the elephants will actually prefer to come down to the river here and dig a hole so that they, they, so that they can get to the fresh water, fresh, clean drinking water. Roger, how are elephants able to sense a nearby water system? So a lot of it will do with experience and you'll see the chances of the matriarch or the leader, the oldest and most mature and knowledgeable cow in a herd. This was a herd, lots of them have moved off already. She'll be very aware of water systems and be aware of the rainfalls in certain areas and she'll over many, many, many years and generations develop and build up a knowledge of where water will be. They've also got an incredibly good sense of smell. So they can even smell fresh water from quite a far way away. But in the riverbed here, they know, particularly around a bend like this, on the further side where the water would have been flowing, that that will be a good place where water will sit and the water table will be slightly higher so that they can actually go there and dig. And they won't have to dig very deep at all. They'll pick the spots, they'll know where they are, and just by understanding how the river course works, you'll be able to pick a spot where you have, won't have to dig too deep. Um, they'll be very well aware of the underground water flow in this riverbed as well. You'll see also elephants get like a lot of nutrients and water, particularly in dry season, from bulbs and tubers that grow quite deep underneath the ground. And you can see a few tusks, particularly that one on the left, you can see those tusks. And I remember watching an elephant the one time walking down the road and we were just following it. And then it stopped and turned around, kind of must have smelt something. I don't know if the wind or what picked it, allowed it to smell this thing. Turned around, walked back about two, three hundred meters, went to an exact point, kind of put its tusk into the ground and like pulled out this huge bulb that'll be full of nutrients, full of moisture, full of water, particularly in the dry season. You'll also see lots of elephants kind of having one tusk and that's a real... Um, possibility as to how they break their tusks as well as so when they put their tusk right into the ground to maybe break a root or look for a bulb or whatever it is that they're wanting to do as they're trying to lift their heads that tusk can often break do you hear that an unhappy elephant on the bank maybe it's an elephant that was initially with these four that has moved up onto the bank to continue feeding maybe it's another herd that's coming in Still a bit of unhappiness there. Kind of joining together. Maybe it's a, a bull that's kind of coming into the herd. And you'll see bulls who are generally nomadic or on their own or in small groups. Well, whatever it was that's coming down this hill. It's caused a little bit of confusion and disturbance with these four. So I can see a bit of movement up ahead of us. I'm just going to spend a moment just see what, see what it is. I'm sure it's just another elephant. It might be a must bull elephant and you'll see when, or even just a bull elephant kind of moving through the herd and he'll be looking for females that might be ready to mate. This is actually a cow that's closest to us on the left that she's walking there. I wonder if she hasn't taken that that loud sign of distress from the other elephants is a sign to keep moving and move on from the water here. And when the males come through the herds, they can often put a lot of pressure and a lot of stress on particularly the calves. And the mothers are very protectful of the calves. So if there's a bit of pressure on them, that can irritate the, the females and put them under pressure, maybe even screeching and shouting like that. Yeah, Brent, just stand by. I'll call you back shortly.
So I'm waiting around here trying to see if whatever it was that caused that disturbance comes down. And you'll see, particularly on the bank, I don't know if you noticed how tricky it can be for what well, looks a bit tricky, but it's actually quite easy for these elephants to get up and down the bank. But coming down the bank, the gravity and momentum on it with an elephant can cause them to come down quite quickly. But it seems like whatever it had, was on the bank has kind of stopped there. Hasn't been another shriek for the past few moments. It's amazing how quiet they are as well. Once they go, if an elephant's not breaking branches or feeding and just walking, for such a big animal, it's amazing how quiet they are. They can sneak up on you very quickly and very easily. There are a few low rumbles and murmurs from the bank. It is quite dense, I can't see anything. Got a quite an eerie feel as well, I mean, Nice overcast day. I wonder how many elephants were in this herd initially that came down to drink. <laughs> Look at that one climbing up <laughs> on the bank. Sorry, I just noticed it. Seemed like those first couple of steps were quite tricky. Look at this one up there, it goes as well. Like they kick into a different gear, put their heads up like that, and just walk up there. They seem to be running quite quickly as well. It's quite interesting to see that behavior. I wonder if they, not being the younger bulls, kind of lost sight of the rest of the herd as they moved up there. Maybe got a, a little bit of a clue as to where they might be and noticing that they might be a little bit far away, quickly realized that they need to do a bit of catch up. And just like that, they're all gone. Disappearing, such big animals disappearing on the banks. It'll be interesting now, that little water hole that they've dug, um, where they've all been drinking from, will provide water to all sorts of other animals. Might be some birds going down there to drink. But yeah, I'm gonna keep going, seeing what else we can find. I'll send you back over to Steve. Dan, good luck. Yeah. Behind Tingana, giving him lots of space. He's still beelining the same direction, stopping and sniffing. Let's just move through there. Guys, but uh, we're not far from our southern boundary now. He's going to go that far. It's hard for me to say. There's a firm out mount directly where he's headed, so I've got a feeling that could be the next port of call. Big termite mound. Hmm. Looks like he might be going left of it. Will help himself, surely. These cats love termite mounds. Well, he's missing it. Straight past.
Okay, well, let's send you back over to Dad and see if we can keep up with Tingana. Good luck in the process and the challenge of trying to keep up with that leopard. I know it can often be quite tricky. So I'm continuing down this riverbed here. We've, those elephants have all moved off now, continuing on their way. And I'm going to stick to the riverbed here. I know there's been recently one of the older lionesses from the Birmingham Pride has been hanging around here. She is getting quite old and quite fragile and quite slow. So she's been hanging around here. I wonder if we won't pop into her. So kind of the best place for us to find leopards is around the little riverbed here. And with the density of trees on the outside, on the banks rather, it's a good place for leopards to hang carcasses, good place for leopards to hide away from maybe some of the lions that are hanging around here. The lions haven't been in and around the riverbed for some time, but it's just so beautiful. It's one of my favorite things to do is just spend some time in the riverbed here, keeping a good look out on the banks. If you enjoy birding as well, really good place to bird. And yeah, I mean, you've got this wide view the density of game is generally highest, maybe not right in the riverbed, but at least on the banks. And they'll ensure that the predators come down as well. It's interesting how our leopard viewing in the past year, it's amazing. I mean, it's been super quiet. There hasn't been so many vehicles and so many people around. And a lot of the females have all had cubs in the past year. And those cubs, a lot of them have never seen or smelt or heard of a vehicle and they can be incredibly shy. So it's actually quite important for us to, to try and view and almost what we call habituate these animals so that they can be viewable. The river also gives you a good chance to do that. So you've got to try and spot these leopard from a bit of a distance away and try and use their behavior to judge the situation. If they start to look a little bit unrelaxed, just stop there, watch them from a distance. And we've got the equipment of a really good camera and a really good zoom to actually be able to watch them from a distance, allow them to settle down and relax and get a little bit closer as they allow, slowly but surely getting closer and closer. You'll also see sometimes, because the radio is a big thing as well. So you'll sit down or you'll leave a vehicle there almost for the whole day. Leave a radio on, so on like a large channel so it is constantly talking. You're not trying to scare the animal, you're just trying to let it become comfortable with what's going on around it. So I'm keeping a good look around. It's a really good place to have a cup of coffee. I know guests on safari, come down, there's some awesome rocky outcrops that you can sit on, have a lovely cup of coffee in the river here and just look for as long as you can see, it's really quite pretty. And it's a good place to look for tracks as well, I mean lots of our animals that we find, most of our animals in fact, particularly here at Ngala, we've got these really large blocks. You want to find leopards and lions, you kind of have to find the tracks first and it's often not so easy or simple to just loop around to the other block because it might be several kilometers and if it is a leopard, the chances of it moving in a direct line or several kilometers in a short space is, is quite unlikely. So we have to do lots of tracking, get down on foot, track these animals and the riverbed is a really good place to find tracks. Nice soft sand, you can see the activity of animals, there's lots of elephants that move around through here. All sorts of things. Great place for lions to den. For those of you who have been watching for some time, the Birmingham Pride almost always have their cubs in and around the riverbed here. Awesome places to hide, little, little lion cubs. Leopards, no exception, they'll also use this riverbed to hide cubs. Just keeping a good look out, kind of on the banks, obviously in the river as well, up in the trees. When I'm looking up in the trees, what I'm kind of looking for is maybe 
a leg that might be dangling down from a carcass or a tail. Those of you, there's that very characteristic like look of a leopard that's hanging in a tree. Often all four of its legs on either side of a branch with a very full belly and a tail hanging down with that little hook at the bottom, kind of keeping a lookout for something like that. Checking the major game pods. Can be a bit tricky on the vehicle sometimes if you're not in the right gear. Founded in 1973, the Endangered Wildlife Trust has consistently and effectively worked towards achieving our conservation legacy. Contribute to this legacy by visiting EWT's Get Wild eShop and purchase products with a purpose. My name is Steve and one of my favorite things at Wild Earth is getting questions from you. The type of questions that I really like are those ones that really help us to unpack and understand and really integrate the ecological knowledge and fully appreciate the importance that animals such as these Cape Buffalo bring to the ecosystem. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, you're going to have to register on the website. But once registered, just head on over to the live safari page and enter your question under the live feed. Look at this, the little one is up and about. Certainly hasn't had enough milk at this age. No amount of milk is enough. Oh, corky. <laughs> Too sweet. Oh, look at this. <laughs> that is stunning. Tune into Wild Earth every single day. It's in your nature. What fascinates me most about the animal circle of life is the intricacies between the large and the very, very small. I mean, it's very easy to go out there and find the large. Once you find the large, the cascading effects down to the small absolutely fascinates me. Alertness and situation awareness is by far the number one aspect for protecting ourselves out on safari. Catch up with the guides daily here on Wild Earth. We have been going round and round with our leopard tracks and now these impala were fighting with each other but then they were also alarm calling. But I've seen it before where they will alarm call to distract each other, to distract the opponent and then, then kind of ram into him. So we've just been sitting with them a little while to watch what they're doing. They're not fighting at the moment, which is good. So if they start to alarm now, I can be sure that something's in the area since they've stopped fighting. But unfortunately, I haven't heard. <laughs> haven't heard anything apart from their usual as this one said. Ooh. I love how they roar like that. Now, Kara was in this area last night and I saw her tracks but it wasn't Kara's tracks with the, that I was following on on Aubrey's road and then through to power lines. Possibly Shudulu also. Could be Tlalamba too. But either way, that animal hasn't come out of that block. So this afternoon, 
we'll search around there too. I think most definitely the alarm calls was a, a strategy to distract and confuse their opponents because after everything settled down, gun for it again. You all love the sounds of the impalas when they're rutting, so do I. I just, just think it's such a an awesome time for the species. We get to really appreciate all the different sounds they make, their speed, their agility. We get to see all those things and I just I love it this time of the year. <laughs> that was a very quick head whip. I haven't seen any tracks here, but I have a feeling that the Impala are not just not just trying to fool me. We're on Sandy, or close to Sandy Patch, but closer to Triple M. So on this end, could be Shududu, could be Tavangumi, even. I haven't heard too many updates about him these last few days. because of how cool it is at the moment and it's also really overcast he could be on the move for for a longer period in the morning hi ak you'd like to know what's my favorite animal to observe i can't choose i have that's very very difficult for me one of my favorite types of things to watch though is interspecies interactions so when they when you have elephants interacting with um, with impala or baboons and wildebeest. I love watching that. I think one of my favorite types of sightings though and one that I will always pursue and absolutely enjoy myself in elephant sightings have to be at the top of the list for me. As it's, those are very, very special to me. But it's very, it's such a difficult thing to choose. They're all so special and every sighting has a potential to be great, phenomenal. And that's why I also enjoy those, the interspecies connection, observing them when they have to deal with one another in the space that they both call home. I really enjoy that. Well, I'm Paul, I've now moved off. I think it would be a good idea to just keep moving around in this general area since it's where we had at least some female leopard tracks. Although I doubt she's come all the way down here. If there's an animal here, I think it's probably Tavangumi. But like I said, I haven't picked up on any male leopard tracks in this area. It's a good, good idea to stick around here, I think. There's some good trees 
around here for hoisting a kill. That's an important thing to take into consideration when we're looking around here, especially if we feel that there may be a leopard around and with the impala males that were rutting, perhaps easy pickings. All right, we'll come back here this afternoon. For now, I'm gonna send you back over to Steve. He's in a bit of a bubble. Welcome back, everyone. Well, Tingana has crossed south into Little Gari. Um, on the road, on Gari, Main, there are lots of tracks of impala that have that ran from Jumasite. I have no doubt the alarm calls we heard earlier were by those impala, and he's following up on whether someone caught one of them. So we're just going to come back along the fire break here. See if we can see anything. Here we go, hyena. Hyena will often find us something. So, hyena's also interested in something that went down on this road. Also listen for alarm calls. see any tracks on the road. Hello, who are you? Looks like an Tima. Could be. Hello. I'm a hyena. Have you got a leopard with you? Well, we're hoping you'd be able to show us where the leopard was. Smells very fresh. Smells like it's right under our car. <laughs> no? What in Tima. What's that boy's name? Had the big welt on his bottom. He's obviously going to have to go follow up on Tingana now. Although, I'm sure, um, some snakes are more venomous than others. Black mambas. Apparently one drop of black mamba venom could kill 12 horses, so... But I don't know, I mean, hyenas are pretty, pretty resilient animals. I think they'd stay very well away from... Uh, a snake. Just having a look where this hyena's going. It's busy sniffing on the side of the road there. This is where the nose of a hyena comes in handy because leopards would have been moving through the grass and like to try and track that is impossible. It's going to cross the main road as well. Okay, well, we'll continue on along this fire break. Maybe we'll be lucky. Maybe we'll see something that the hyena missed. Lincoln, they're bigger than you think. Females bigger than males for the most part. Um, like a big dog, like a, a, what do you call him? A Rottweiler. <laughs> a Rottweiler, maybe? 
they don't look that big when you see them in the car but when you suddenly realize hang on a second this guy is very big but um they're pretty chilled with people hyenas don't cause us too much heartache while we're awake just don't fall asleep with your door open Well, don't leave, leave your shoes outside. <laughs> you learn your lessons very quickly. They like to eat shoes, don't they, Davi? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're just going to drive up this boundary. We might be lucky. Well, you know, we thought would have made life easy for us. This goes to show it's not as easy as you think sometimes. But what a wonderful way to spend the last morning with Tingana. Beautiful. Beautiful Tingi. Wow, Lucas, the most. Um, 120 somewhere around there. Uh, not here on Juma, we haven't counted that many. It's difficult because when we do birding competitions on Juma, we have to get them on camera. But um, when I used to train, we used to do birding competitions. Group A versus Group B, we'd go out and see how many birds we could get on a drive. And I think, yeah, I must actually look back, it's probably the 140s. 140s in a in a drive, which is a lot of birds, a lot of birds. But that's in the summer, and that's with a lot of people on board going bird, 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 and you've all got to see them. But seeing uh, seeing 50 birds in a drive is good. It's good. We've done we've done more than 50 on camera, haven't we? In one drive. That's very impressive. Getting them on camera. The amount of birds that fly away before you come to us. It's a lot. It's a lot. Those two times that he disappeared and arrived back, right shot by that big um, torchwood. Straight into Juma towards Treehouse Dam. Wouldn't that be a surprise this afternoon, this morning? Seeing old, the little chief. Not so little anymore. Turn around and you can't reverse at a quick speed either. So we kind of went in and this musk bull elephant had obviously heard us and he was very responsive to vehicle noise or the noise of the vehicle and he was unhappy about it and he kind of harassed us quite aggressively running to the bank which is above us and you have this huge potentially six ton elephant standing. The bank is two meters, he might be standing four meters tall, looking down at you, like running from 20 meters away towards you. He did this for about 45 minutes, and it was a bit of a hair-raising experience. I had, how many guests on the back? Six guests on the back. Guests 